Um, I'm going to read a poem now about, it's called Kathmandu. We lived in Kathmandu. We lived in India first, then we lived in Kathmandu, then we moved to India, then we moved to uh, North Carolina, then Austin, New York, and then Bedford now. And we loved living in all those different places. They were all wonderful. So this is the longest poem I'm reading. I'll just have a couple more. Kathmandu. Buddha has lived here and does still. I became a newlywed then in this place with little purchase. My husband had lived here before with his precious girlfriend who drowned in a river. The road she was driving along collapsed and left her no way to escape. She has an identical twin sister. Just inside our small house, decorated in pink and red, there was a place reserved for watching over the dead. I became a discoverer there twice. Things that animals do not notice, that they are being considered for sacrifice, that their owners are hungry, that they may become food. One day I was asked to join a tour group traveling from America to visit a Tibetan doctor. I knew the group's leader. He was also an author who wrote about forbidden waterfalls, hidden mountains, and secrets. I did not know what to expect. This doctor called on each of us to approach her as one by one she quietly identified our affliction, sucked out blood and hair and bits of gristle through our skin, which she spat out into a big silver bowl. One woman had breast cancer. I was the last to be treated, didn't have to identify, it, I was the last to be treated, didn't have to identify my area of illness. Without a word, the doctor unzipped my pants and sucked near my right ovary. When I got home, I stripped, took a picture of myself in the mirror, teeth marks, and a big oval showed up. That same week, I had asked the local butcher about when he would need more meat. The day before, I had noticed that two goats waited, tethered, behind his shed. I asked to film the procedural slaughter, as I imagined it would be fascinating. What I saw then was an hour-long dance of the greatest precision. <coughs> Excuse me. What I saw then was an hour-long dance of the greatest precision, like surgery done in open air, starting with the neck being slit while the goat was still held by the rope. After the head came off, the body shook. A bit later, the body crumpled to the ground. The butcher split the animal open lengthwise and opened it like a book, took various organs out, separating them into bowls. Last were the long beads of intestine. They were a lighter pink compared to other parts. Blood was at a minimum and also put into a separate bowl. This was 30 years ago. The most startling violence of this, the thing I remember most of all, left to watch, the second goat still tied to the rope. So a lot of things I end up writing about, and I'm sure this is true for lots of people, are things that we've seen, we've heard, we've read. I have a couple, I have a couple films that I always go back to thinking about a reference for something. And one of, two of them are Sofia Coppola's films. One is Lost in Translation, when Bill Murray whispers into Scarlett Johansson's ear. Second is Marie Antoinette, and there's just, they're at the Summer Palace having the, that big party and all of them have huge, I think pompadours is what they're called, hairstyles. And uh, there's a thorn bush outside and there's just a little wisp of cotton caught on the thorn bush. It's one of the most beautiful small, small shots I've ever seen. I also love um, the way we were when Robert Redford talks about seeing someone on a train. He didn't go up to her, he didn't say hello to her, and he always wished he had. And then there was a film called The World of Henry Orient with Paula Prentice and Peter Sellers. And there's a, f there's a scene where two little girls, probably around 12 years old, were watching people kissing. And I always thought that reminded me of my best friend Andrea and myself watching this couple. So I, I, think about, I think about those kinds of scenes all the time. 